Welcome to the Andy Dare Show. This is episode 47. This week I'm joined by James Van Osel, a radio idol of mine. We talk about everything from Little League to Lollapalooza. It's such an honor to have him on the show. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody, thank you so much for checking out the Andy Dare Show. This is episode 47 with a radio idol of mine, James Van Osdell. It's a great interview. We talk about everything from Chicago radio to Lollapalooza to uh, his, his family to everything. There's no stone left unturned with this interview. I'm so proud of this one. But before we get into that, I'd like to uh, mention my sponsors. Um, it's pretty much barbecue season already, so why don't you get yourself some steakhouse quality burgers, chicken, fish, with getting the Mangrate. Uh, the Mangrate is a big chunk of Detroit steel. It's a grate that you put on your existing you know, coat hanger-esque grate that comes with the grill. You put this big thing right on top of your grill, and it instantly uh, rewards you with you know, steakhouse quality burgers. You get the dark grill marks that you really can't get on these little chintzy grill grates. So uh, do yourself a favor, if you want to impress your guests, if you're grilling out this uh, spring and summer, get yourself the man grate. And uh, if you want to support the show, just go to theandydareshow.com. There's a banner on the right. You just click on that, and uh, we get to wet our beaks a little bit. So that would be awesome. That is called the man grate. And by Uncle Bub's award-winning barbecue. Yes, another barbecue sponsor, but I love barbecue. It's in my heart, so why not? Put that out there to the world. Um, Uncle Bub's award-winning barbecue is a restaurant, and it's also a full-service catering company uh, located in Westmont, Illinois. Give them a call at 630-493-9000. If you're in the area, it's 132 South Cass, Westmont, Illinois. It's a great family-friendly place to go on a Friday, Saturday night. Um, they have the real deal barbecue, smokers uh, attached to the building in the back. I mean, the whole like neighborhood smells like hickory smoke. And that is a great thing. And uh, so they do have great barbecue. They got great homemade sides. But on the catering sides of things, if you're doing a wedding and you don't want to have some snooty, you know, Parisian affair, uh, you can have some awesome barbecue brought right out to your wedding and have servers there. They have a really helpful staff. I've been one of them from time to time. Um, they do the weddings. They do picnics. They do corporate lunches. They do uh, pig roasts, luau's. They do a whole bunch of stuff. And they go pretty far, too. I had somebody ask me about the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. That's a little too far. I mean, but we do go to the border of Wisconsin, I believe. We go down south a couple hours. We have quite a radius there. So do check it out. It's Uncle Bub's. You can find out more info at UncleBub's.com. And bye. Secondhand Mall, also in Westmont, Illinois. My record store of 28 years. Remember when records... Um, sadly sold out all their inventory. The guy retired. He's an awesome guy, Hank. And he retired and sold out all the inventory to the secondhand mall that was next door. So they took over the, the old spot where he was. So they really expanded. They have a huge vinyl selection. I've been noticing the vinyl is uh, selling pretty well now. A lot of kids are going in there rediscovering the coolness of vinyl. And, uh, if you're still into CDs like I am, they have a big CD selection. You know, it runs from like a dollar to four dollars. So you could really buy a stack for pretty cheap. Um, if you're not a musical guy, we also have power tools. We have movies. We have video games, electronics. Um, there's musical instruments, whole bunch of stuff. Nice atmosphere, nice guys. That secondhand mall located at 309 West Ogden Avenue. Give them a call. They buy, sell, trade. If you want to... Uh, Turn that stack of CDs in your closet that's collecting dust into some spending cash. Why not call them up? It's 630-810-9980. They're open. Uh, it's Monday through Saturday from 10 to 5. And uh, you can find out more info at secondhandmall.com, a.k.a. 2ndhandmall.com. All right, well, that's enough for the sponsors. want to thank my sponsors. It's always great having them on board. Um but, uh, yeah, what's new in the world of Andy so far, uh, you know, second week of May? You can find me pretty much every Friday on my segment, Talking Tunes with Andy, um, on the Kevin Matthews Show. And it's funny, uh, Kevin Matthews is now on the Steve Dahl Network, as is James Van Osdell. 
seems like the podcast is really taking off the medium of podcasting. People are really uh, diving off of traditional radio and finding all the freedom they can get by uh, doing podcasts. This one is a pay site. I believe if you subscribe, you get the first month for free. And uh, I believe if you just want to do it on a monthly basis, it's just $10 for, I mean, four shows. You got the Steve Dahl Show, the Kevin Matthews Show, the James Van Oswald Show, and uh, flashbacks with uh, Stephen Gary from the 80s, 90s, a whole bunch of flashback episodes. Those are great. They got one with Sam Kinison. It's amazing. So do check it out. You can find uh, the Kevin Matthews Show at Dahl.com, D-A-H-L.com. And uh, that's pretty much it for now. I just love that I'm all the way up to my 47th episode, found, finding a whole bunch of more fans on our Facebook page, a lot of more followers on the Twitter. People are enjoying the YouTube site, and it really means a lot to me. You know, a year and a half into this, doing it on my own. Um, I want to thank Kev for, uh, you know, reaching out to me, letting me do a music minute on his show. It really means a lot to me. So, uh yeah, without further ado, here is my episode 47 interview with James Van Osdell. All right, I'm on the line with James Van Osdell. How you doing, James? I- I'm good. Thank you for uh, letting me be part of this. Well, uh, it's been a while. I've just uh, kind of grew up on your voice, and uh, it's such a blast having you here on the Andy Dare Show. Um, so you had a brisk night for a little baseball practice, right? Yeah, yeah you know, nice 40-degree night, Little League. It, when, you do, when you commit to being a Little League parent, you just expect that there will be cold, windy, uncomfortable nights. It's just part of, part of the thing. Exactly. It ranges from that to, like, excruciating 90-degree summer heat, you know, so. Never in the middle, exactly. <laughs> how, how old is your son, if you mind me asking? I do mind. Uh, he's 10. <laughs> okay, so 10, 10 years old. Yeah, you're pretty much right at the brink of where baseball becomes exciting to watch with the kids. Like, you know, if, like during T-ball, it's just you're kind of, you know, just having fun with your son. But it, 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 about 11 or 12 is when, uh, you know, the kids start hitting, kids start pitching a little faster. It gets more exciting to watch, right? Oh, it's definitely fun. He did football one year. And I got to say, football parents are the biggest dicks I've ever <laughs> experienced. And this was maybe three years ago. And it was flag football. And I, I was so turned off of sports parents in general. And for the playoff games, there was a group of parents. This is like 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And they were tailgating in the parking lot. I'm like... <laughs> What? I, this is no joke. I'm like, seriously, you guys are boozing before your six-year-old's game. I, I'm not sure what, what message you're sending, but I'm pretty sure it's awful. They're probably betting on the game, too. Jeez, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> baseball parents are much more civil. To, to to completely generalize. Exactly. They're more of the bleacher bums types. You know, I, I like those guys better, you know. Yeah, it's all good. You know, kid on the other team has a good hit. You cheer for him. And yeah, way to go, buddy. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I like that. And I do miss it being, you know, 10 years out of uh, Pony League or whatever I, I played up until about high school. But yeah, so this is a big deal for me. I'm trying to do my own thing with the podcast here. I've been uh, I've been like picked up by the Kevin Matthews show to do a music minute. So I thought I'd reach out to James Van Oslo, who's also part of the Steve Dahl Network. How, how are you doing over on the Steve Dahl Network? Is that a lot of freedom? I, well, it's nothing but freedom. I mean, it, it's so different from doing years of radio and steve just said do what you want have fun you gotta love that but at the same time is it like where do i i need a little bit of direction kind of or no is it just awesome yeah no you know i started podcasting a couple years ago and i stopped for a while but i did it for about a year and you get into a group it's fun and you are essentially your own boss you can do what you want and it's I, i i don't feel like i need direction because it that to me is the opposite of what this whole medium allows for it's it, podcasting allows you to take you know this uh, it allows you to take chances to throw along to to you know follow your own find your own way and follow your own muse sure and even awards you like the chance to take a risk on a guess that you might not think would work that a, a radio executive would say hell no to that in a second but if you give it a try who knows it might be it might turn out being a good friend of yours in the long run you know yeah it, my feeling is who gives a shit i i I want to talk to people who interest me who are, or who I think might be interesting. When I did radio for so so many years, if there was a guest in the studio, it was so tightly regimented. Okay, you've got three minutes, then you know, coming out of that three minutes, go into spots, then come out of spots, mention that the guest is there, go into a song, and then do a quick wrap-up. I, I think it's insulting 
uh, to say that the audience doesn't want to hear what someone has to say. And, you know, you let these things kind of go however they're going to go. And maybe some people will be interested. Maybe they won't. I, I, it doesn't matter. I, I'm doing it because I want to. And that's 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 why I'm here. That's so awesome. And yeah, it's definitely an, an honor to have you. But how about like your first memory in radio? Did you do the whole high school radio thing? I, I wish uh, my high school didn't have radio that I, I think that would have been a blast. I did college radio. I, I went to the University of Kansas for two years. I, I worked at KJHK in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, I got kicked out of Lawrence, Kansas. And then uh, now maybe three years after that, I went to Columbia College here in Chicago and I worked in the morning at their station, which is WCRX, which is all like urban and house music. <laughs> I, I, I have no evidence that I was ever on that station. I was ashamed of everything I did because it was such a such a bad fit. And I realized it was it, it's a laboratory. You're there to learn and you know get your mechanics done. But it just it sounded so terrible. And I, I made a point of never saving anything I did there. Yeah, pretty much. I went to Columbia for about a semester and uh, all the professors, they all told me, well, if you want to go do this, you just got to get yourself out there and start doing it. And then I said, well, why am I forking over eight grand a semester to, to get that message, you know? And it was at the time when studios were not making much money and I was trying to become a studio engineer and stuff like that. And they pretty much told me to not take their classes, to, to do your own thing. So I am doing my own thing. So maybe Columbia is a little bit to thank for that whole deal, you know? Well, yeah, Columbia worked out for me. It got me thinking in the right direction. And I ended up teaching there for a couple of semesters. But as far as, I, I believe that, if you're going to succeed, you need to be well-read and well-rounded. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to take Shakespeare classes. You just have to know what the fuck is going on in the world around you. Columbia did not give me that well-rounded education. They gave me a laser-focused mm -hmm. education, got me thinking in the right direction. But you know, I was able to graduate college without taking a math course. Oh, wow. At, at, <laughs> some, at some point, you have to say, maybe that was a mistake. Maybe <laughs> Maybe I should have mastered algebra before I went out into the world. Uh, you know, at the time I was grateful, but, you know, as I'm helping that 10 year old son of mine to do his math homework, I'm realizing there is a fine line that I'm about to cross where I'm not going to be able to help him anymore. That's what I worry about having kids myself, James. Yeah, I can definitely uh, respect that, you know. But uh, yeah, so you got the book. You've been working on it for a couple of years. Is this something that you obviously started while you were still at Q101? Uh, we're talking about the oral history of Q101, yes? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting. I put out a book last year. I self-published a book, which was just like, kind of like a repurposing of blog posts and other music-related writings. And around the time I put that out, Q101 announced, or it was announced that Q101 was going away. I thought, wow, this is a great excuse to write that book about radio I've always <laughs> wanted to write. And I, I completely walked away from that other book I published, stopped promoting it, everything, and put all of my energy into using Kickstarter, the, the crowdfunding site, to publish this Q101 book, which has since been named We Appreciate Your Enthusiasm. And I started working on it in earnest, really around August of last year. And uh, as of very recently, I've completed my first draft, and I'm in the process of fine-tuning everything, getting everything lined up, and uh, getting it set to go off to the editor. And have you met your Kickstarter goal? Or... Oh, yeah. No, th yeah, you've got... A maximum of 90 days. You you set the goal. Uh, I hit. I didn't start. That's the thing. I didn't start working on the book until I knew for sure I'd be able to publish it. I, I, I felt like, well, that, that'd be kind of a drag to put all this effort into it and then not be able to go go the distance. Yeah. So I kind of hemmed and hawed and hesitated. And uh, I think I set a 45 day goal. I hit it uh, right around the time Q101 went off the air. And then I started you know, accelerating my effort. How did you promote the, like that Kickstarter page without being on the air? Was this something that you use like social media to help you with? Or? Yeah, I, you know, I certainly use Twitter, and it, it was the right idea at the right time. I, I don't, you know, claim that I had some brilliant masterstroke concept. It was just it, it was of the moment, and because it was of the moment, a lot of people who had an interest in it helped me. I mean, Kickstarter is great. It's, it's like you have your own street team for your project because when people pledge money and say, I want to be part of this project, they in turn let other people know about it. And in a case of a book like this, if, if I'm Bob Smith and I pledge money, I want to see my name in this book. So sure, yeah. as Bob Smith, I'm going to tell my buddies, hey, you should pledge. You can get your name in the book too. So it really worked out great. I, I'm extraordinarily grateful. I, I think I've probably bored all my backers by telling them <laughs> that over and over. 
Um, but yeah, it was the right idea, right time. And I had people helping me along the way. I did some media for it. Uh, and certainly when Q, when it was finally announced, when Q101's jocks could say on the air that the station was going away, they were able to start mentioning it too. So I, I got a lot of plugs from uh, some friends of mine there as the station was going away. So it, it just worked out. Sure. Are you, are you still friends with any of the DJs there? Is Ryan Mano a good guy or? Uh, you know, I, I like to believe that I get along with everyone I've ever worked with. Um, sure. I'm sure Ryan's a good guy. Uh, I spent a long time on the phone with Brian the Whipping Boy last night. Uh, you know, I, I communicate with everybody, and I, I have no bad feelings about anyone I worked with. It, it was, through the years, wildly different personalities, but I got along with them all. Sure, I got a doozy for you here. Um, um, did social media and the networking and all that, did that help kill radio, and how important was that to kill radio? Because before... You guys really were the only tastemakers in town, or just a handful of you, and now everybody is kind of their own tastemaker in a way, right? No, I don't think it killed radio. I mean, radio was its own worst enemy, but I, I wouldn't put all the blame or give all the credit to social media. I mean, if radio is smart, or when radio is smart, they, social media is a part of that experience and, and that community building. Um, and I, I kind of bristle when you say Q101 was a tastemaker. Oh, my God, I don't think <laughs> it was. I think it was influential and it was uh, very important for pop culture but it, locally, but I, I wouldn't call it a tastemaker. I don't think anyone listened to Q101 and said, holy shit, three days grace, this is cutting <laughs> edge. Um, you, you know, for that sort of thing, there, you know, there, there's Pitchfork or whatever. Um, but, yeah, Q101 wasn't setting the world on fire by playing the Red Hot Chili Peppers every 75 minutes. That's true. That was probably just like, you know, the right place at the right time. Um, yeah. But as far as social media goes, I, I think for a format like what Q101 was, it, it could only help. I, I don't think it was was responsible for its demise. Q101 did a lot of things to uh, bring about its end before it was sold. Awesome. Yeah. And speaking of that, I just heard your interview with um, De Rogatis. And I wasn't quite aware of all the CD underbelly of Lollapalooza and stuff. <laughs> I had uh, I'd read little bits and pieces here and there, but it really kind of opened my eyes. And uh, I mean, I, I listen to Sound Opinions pretty faithfully. Um, how did you meet Jimmy DeRogatis back in the day? Jimmy DeRogatis, uh, it was it was timing. I started working at Q101. It was probably 1993. I was a programming assistant there, and the program director at the time was working on bringing. Uh, Bill Wyman and Jim DeRogatis over to Q101, and he, they needed a producer. And I just, you know, I was the right guy. I was into music. They said, or the program director said, you'd probably make the most sense with these guys. And so you know, he introduced me to them, and it just, it kind of went from there. Did you start piping up on air with that? Or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They, Jim loved, you know, giving me 30 seconds here or there, and he, he was great. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm a pretty big like record nerd myself growing up, and I was the only uh, 13 year old at the Riviera for the Radiohead show in '97 to go to see Greg Cott and uh, introduce myself. And <laughs> he yeah he was pretty amazed that some little kid knew him. But uh, yeah, pretty much stayed up on it since about like '94 '95. That's cool. And now I'm trying to make it my living slowly but surely, and I'm finding that podcasting is definitely the new route, the new freedom that I've been looking for, not trying to pander to little like radio stations across the country. I'm just trying to do my own thing, and hopefully people are interested in it. Um, have you found it hard to build the word of uh, being on the Steve Dahl Network because it is a pay site? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I would probably have a harder time as a free podcaster to make my way. And I've certainly gone that route before. I, Steve's, Steve's a legend. I mean, he is nationally known. He is, he's, he's a rock star. I mean, he was, you know, it, it's hard to imagine in this day and age, the idea of a radio personality being a rock star, because now they're all a bunch of, you know, minimum wage working mm -hmm. strokes, uh, all due respect to everyone who I currently know in the business. But back in the day, Dahl was a rock star. So, I mean, the, just being part of what he's created, I think, helps get the word out. Um, you know, the medium itself, podcasting, I, I still feel like there is a lot of knowledge that's yet to be acquired by the public when it comes to understanding this delivery mechanism. It, I think there's there's just a lot of unknown. It, people just don't get it yet. It, people think, oh, podcasting, do I need to own an iPod for this? No, it, it's all it is. It, the, the way I try to describe it to, to people who have no clue is it, it's like subscribing to a magazine. You say, hey, I would like to get Newsweek. 
then every time a new issue is available, hey, it shows up right at your front door. It's that simple, except instead of getting Newsweek, you're getting Steve Dahl, Kevin Matthews, and me. Sure, yeah, you're getting a file instead of something that you have to be there at the right moment to hear, which I love, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, getting the word out, you know, it's, I, I think the best way, or the most confident way you can get the word out about anything you work on is do it yourself. No one's going to do it for you. And on the radio, you know, stations have their priorities and sometimes it won't be you as a disc jockey. The best way you can get the word out there is to put yourself out there. And that's, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. And being under the Steve Dahl halo certainly helps. Sure. I love what you said about Steve Dahl, you know, being a, a true original rock star back in the day. In fact, a listener just gave me an old crinkled up poster of uh, Steve Dahl, Gary Meyer, Kevin Matthews, and Johnny B all uh, playing pool, and it's a Bud Dry ad from like 1988. That kicks ass. Yeah, and I, I just loved it. It was like, this is kind of what I want my, rec my, uh, my jockeys to look like. These guys are cool, you know? These guys are rock stars, and uh, yeah, like Steve Dahl driving around in, in the Jeep, you know, the disco demolition stuff. I've just been trying to spread the word, because some of these, like the new kids, I, I work at a restaurant with a bunch of teenagers, and they don't really know his story, they don't really sure. know where he's come from, so I find it something that I'm trying to spread to the new kids, because, man, that guy was cool, and that's something that I want to be, you know? Here's the thing about Steve. He still, I mean, he's he's always done this radio verite where... It's just it, it it's reality radio, and he's always just been putting himself out there. Just every detail of his life—I mean, his wife, his kids, everything he thinks, every thought that rolls through his head—he puts it out there. So he's always sounded very contemporary to me because it—it's not contrived. It is honest, and it, he's got—he's he, cl clearly an educated guy, or at least a very well-read guy. Um, he, he carries himself so well, and he's got such a quick wit about him. I, I, I think for these kids today that you mentioned at your restaurant, I, I think they would get it. I, I think Steve manages to transcend, you know, age and era. Sure, definitely. Um, do you stay up on like other podcasting too? Like uh, I'm really into Adam Carolla out on the sure. West Coast. He's got the number one most downloaded podcast in uh, I think in the world because he had Guinness books like make sure that is a, a natural rule there. And like Mark Marin, he's got the a WTF podcast. Sure. They just had the guy from the Shins on and it was really transcendent episode with that. I, I, I really found this a new medium to be pretty exciting almost. I, I got almost too much to listen to now, you know. Oh, for, and yeah, that's a good problem. Now, Adam, I think, is great. I've always thought that he is one of the funniest guys in, in all media. I thought he was you know, great on Loveline for all those years. He was on Q101. Uh, I loved watching him when uh, he and Drew had the show on, uh, was it MTV or VH1? No, that, yeah, yeah, that was MTV, for sure. Well, yeah, I enjoyed watching them on television. I, I think Adam is incredibly funny, and he, he's, he's gifted, for sure. Yeah, so the, like the same thing happened to him. He got shit canned from his radio job on a Friday, started up on Monday in his garage with a recorder, you know? Yeah, to take the power back. I, I am, especially, you know, after I put out, put out my book last year and started working on this next one and podcasting, I can't imagine not going DIY for anything anymore. I, I mean, the internet has a lot of good things about it, but the fact that it, it has enabled people to stay more true to what they want to do and embrace audiences more easily. I, I, there's so much benefit to just doing it yourself. Yeah. Like I kind of would like to see how like the punk rockers and even the hippies of the sixties, people like that, how much they would have loved, uh, you know, this even playing field that everybody has, it seems. Yeah. I mean, hang around uh, the NATO area next week. <laughs> ask a hippie uh, how they feel about it in the present day. Uh oh, that's very true. Very true. Um, how about this one? Uh, how about, was there ever a band that like misunderstood something you said on air and then uh, kind of uh, was mean to you or started up like a, a beef with J JVO? No, I, you know, certainly uh, the aforementioned Jim DeRogatis has plenty of stories like that, you know, pissing off people like Ryan Adams and you know, they went after Jim. I, I, I don't have experiences like that where they came after me because of something I said, but I, I certainly have plenty of experiences with bands who were just douchebags and who just... <laughs> too cool for the room um more often than not it was new bands some of the more veteran bands are way more slick and professional about the way they conduct themselves the only exceptions uh one of the worst interviews i ever did was with the red hot chili peppers really huh i i thought they were all assholes um yeah chad smith especially i thought was a, a complete cock uh, it just you know it's a bunch of guys who think they're too cool for school they have all these in jokes and they just 
go out of their way to derail your conversation. And it, they, they sucked. And it's not... It's not okay to talk about this yet, but the Beastie Boys were also awful. So talk to me about that after we get past this morning for MCA because they were terrible to me. That is funny. Yeah, I would like to get into that. But, uh, yeah, that is too funny. People I would expect the aforementioned three days grace, not not stand-up fellas, no? I, I've never, <laughs> never met them. Or, or I probably have. I wouldn't recognize them if I had. Yeah, I mean, like, I really felt your pain when you had to deal with that whole, like, the new metal crowd of, you know, 2005 to till the end, you know, there. It was pretty rough with those puddles of mud and, you know, all those guys. How did you get through it, JVO? Well, and the simple answer is it's a job. Um, the, the more complex answer is I, I, I have a much more open mind to, to a lot of different things. I mean, puddle of mud, sure, that, that's pretty brutal. Um, Limp Biscuit, terrible. But you know, for all of those bands, I could find a band that I was playing that I could get behind. So it, it balanced out. I didn't love everything I played, but it's a job. I mean, suck it up. I mean, how hard is it to push a button that starts a song, turn down the volume, and you know, do some research or you know, take a request? Or it, it wasn't. It, it's not hard work. Being on the radio is not working in a coal mine. It's not. It's not open heart surgery. It's talking and playing music. It. it if you're so bothered by the music that you can't go on, then you probably should choose a different line of work. That's or, start very, a yeah. <laughs> or start a podcast. It's very true. Um, how about like talking to bands? Do you do a lot of research? Um, do you bring notes with you, or or is it something that's more just like a like free form like jazz? Hello. Here I am. JBO. Yeah. yeah. Hi. You sound you sound a little bit like you're in a box. Hello. Hello, here I am. Okay. Wait, we're saying internet connection problem. There's a problem. Hello? Still here. Okay, Hello? can can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay, sounds good. Um, Yeah, so do you do research, or is it just something that's more freeform like jazz? Uh, do research for what? For interviews? Yeah, for interviews. Of course. I, I, I have worked with plenty of people who have said, oh, I'm just going to wing it, and it shows. I, I think... Out of respect for the person you're talking to, you should know something about them. You shouldn't just, you know, walk in a room, turn a microphone on and go. I think it's I think it's disrespectful to do that. So, you know, if I'm interviewing a band, I make sure I listen to as much of their catalog all the way through at least once. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do think about what I'm going to say before I start talking to somebody. Cool. How about like a, a memory of a band that you were uh, talking to before their fame, like maybe when they just first started that it would come on to be a huge success. I'm sure there's a lot of bands, but is there one in particular that you remember when they were just small time scrubs? A couple, I guess one stands out and I don't know why. I think it's because I, I just looked through my Q at one book and there was another story about this band. I remember when no doubt um, had just, I want to say it was just before tragic kingdom came out. They were doing an 18 and over, like 11 p.m. show at Metro. They, Their record company said to Q101, hey, we've got this band. Uh, it's their second album. We just want to get them you know, comfortable doing interviews. Would you be willing to interview them? And so I ended up taping an interview with them that never aired. Uh, Q101 did a lot of that, where they'd take interview opportunities, bank them for later, and never use them. It was, it was a horrible, horrible. I, I hated that idea. My feeling is you got abandoned? Hey, put them on the radio. That was not a popular opinion, sure. but then again, the ratings were, you know, huge. So maybe, maybe I'm the asshole, <laughs> but uh, I had Tom Dumont and Gwen Stefani in the studio. And we talked for about 30 or 40 minutes. I recorded it again, never aired, but they were really grateful for the interview. They thought it was amazing. Fast forward six months or probably less. And they were doing a headlining show all ages at Metro, you know, seven o'clock doors or six o'clock doors, whatever. And I went back backstage after the show to, to say hi. And uh, I was there with a couple of friends of mine from the radio station. And Gwen saw me and she ran across the room, gave me a kiss on the cheek. She's like, oh, I'm so glad you came. Nice. <laughs> and this is after, you know, Just a Girl started to explode and spider webs. And my friend's like, how does she know you? I'm like, I interviewed her, I guess, before they were famous. I, I, I guess I guess it's I guess it took. She wouldn't recognize me now for, you know, for any amount of money in the world. But back then, I thought it was pretty neat. Yeah, you should have told your friends, oh, we go way back. Yeah, we go way back. Yeah, yeah I was banging her back <laughs> in <each> county. 
<laughs> well, that was really weird because I, I swear one of my early like memories of you was interviewing Gwen and Tom. Did that later re-air? Because I think I, I probably interviewed them about four times. Because I yeah, I definitely remember. I think they played like spider webs acoustically, and I was just like, "Who is this girl singer? She is just incredible." My first time ever hearing it. But you're saying that didn't air until after? I don't think it ever aired. It never aired. Okay. Huh, maybe I heard him on something else, but yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And it's weird that I would uh, be thinking about that. Strange, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Local 101, all that good stuff. Um, now we were doing the podcast, and we got Lollapalooza this summer. Obviously, you can hear his latest episode. They talk all about it. Um, no, there's not that many bands that we're, I'm really too interested in, um, except for one. How about Afghan Wigs? Do you, re- do you Were you a fan of them? Sure, I was. I, I saw them a bunch of times. I I think Greg Dooley is, uh, he's, he, he's a rock star, man. He's sitting on stage, smoking a cigarette. He's like six foot five. Uh, he, he is all presence and swagger. And, uh, yeah, it, the wigs are cool. I mean, some of those albums, I mean, gentlemen is such a good album. Um, oh God, what was the album with, uh, honky's ladder? I can't remember it. Black but love. It, yeah. Thank you. And cool, cool band. Yeah, it seemed like Q and One didn't give the love to them as much. Um, sure. It seemed like they were a little bit too soulful alternative. It was weird. They liked to merge like Motown with grunge at the time, which was really interesting to me. Yeah, they, they, you know, there are a lot of bands you could say that about. You know, the station didn't get behind band X, Y, or Z. Yeah, the the cooler, the the more fringy bands uh, weren't embraced. You know, the the alternative format was a pop format. I mean, top forty rotations. Um, it was all about playing the most accessible songs for the greatest number of people. I mean, it's not about it. It never was about, you know, finding those cool bands that you might see at Empty Bottle at midnight on a Tuesday night. That's that that wasn't what the, the station was trying to make money. So they tried to play mass appeal songs. Afghan wigs were never mass appeal. Very true. Yeah. And it seems like a band like the Smashing Pumpkins totally hit the iron right at the perfect time and uh, totally was able to cat- catapult into stardom, partially because of Q101's do. No, I no, no way. Q101 had nothing to do with the Smashing Pumpkins success. Smashing Pumpkins put out uh, Siamese Dream and that album had been out for a few months and Q101 didn't touch anything off that record. I mean, Charlie. Really? Huh. My God, XRT played um, tracks off Gish. I mean, first time I heard the Pumpkins, I heard Rhinoceros. I think Richard Milne played it on XRT. Um, Q101 ignored Siamese Dream when it first launched as an alternative station. Um, and it took a while, but finally they grudgingly embraced Disarm. I mean, oh, I, re- okay. I, I was there. I, I remember it. It, it. They were they were slow to the party. <laughs> Pumpkins were all I mean, They had the record release show. JBTV was there. Q101 had nothing to do with it. So, really? yeah, yeah. if anyone tells you otherwise, Q101 had nothing. Q101 supported the Pumpkins. I mean, from that point forward, it was balls to the wall, full support, you know, all the way, you know, Pisces is carried after that, Melancholy after that. I mean, it was full on support, but Q101 did not break the Pumpkins or, or were in no way, you know, helpful of their ascent. So they were late to the on the train on that one, huh? Q101 was late to everything. And Q101, when I started there, they they wouldn't play Pearl Jam. They wouldn't play Nirvana. They wouldn't play Stone Temple Pilots. It, it was a format that started as an adult contemporary AAA hybrid, AAA being adult album alternative. So they, they were playing The Cure and Dada and The Gin Blossoms, but they were avoiding you know a couple of records that came out in 91 that seemed to do okay, Pearl yeah. Jam 10 and Nirvana Nevermind. I'd say uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they were they were slow to the party. They were. They, this was not a station that broke records. They were a station that supported them. Speaking of Billy Corgan, uh, have you interviewed him and how many times? What kind of interview is that guy? I, gosh, I haven't interviewed him since the Pumpkins uh, broke up. Um, last time I interviewed him slash talked to him was December of 2000. Oh, I mean, okay. he, he, was, he was great the few times I interviewed him. Um, but yeah, no, I, haven't, I haven't seen him, talked to him, anything like that in you know, 12 years. At the time, did you believe him as we all did that that was truly the end of the Pumpkins? Or did you feel, eh, he'll probably be back after about six or seven years? You know, I believed it. It, it. Since then, it, you know, logic has told me how silly that was because no band stays broken up forever. I mean, even Zeppelin got back together for the Ahmed Etrigan uh, thing. No band goes away forever. Sure, and every and like a band that all four members are still alive, it always kind of irks me when they still won't get together. They they will keep denying all the cash that's on the table, a la the Smiths, a la Husker Du. 
the replacements. I mean, I guess Bob Stinson's dead, but uh, there's a lot of bands like that. And I don't know, I, I can kind of see his way of, I did write all the songs, I created this legacy almost single-handedly, why can't I continue with the brand name, you know? Mm-hmm. I get it. Yeah, but I'm just, uh, I don't, I'm not too excited about the new album being that Jimmy Chamberlain, I mean, he is definitely the, the, the like like the most important ingredient in the stew of the Smashing Pumpkins. How can you take that out and then replace him with, what, a 19-year-old green drummer named Mike Byrne? I don't know about that. Jimmy's a great drummer, and he, he's, he is unique. There aren't a lot of guys doing what he does in contemporary rock and roll. Um, but, you know, I, I think when it comes to, again, going back to that idea of the masses, what are they clinging to when they listen to the Smashing Pumpkins? It's not it's not the backbeat. It's the guy singing and the words he's singing. The person front and center is the one who people cling to. You and I get it. You know, Ch- Chamberlain is is a big deal, but for the general person who got hooked on the Pumpkins because of Tonight's Night or you know Rocket or Disarm, they don't really give a shit who's behind the drum kit. It, it, it's Billy. That that is true. Now that I think about it, there. Um... Just got a couple more things for you here. Um, I grew up in a record store pretty much. My dad just dragging me as a kid, but then slowly fell in love with it. Got a job after high school working there, so I kind of soaked it all up. How about like your favorite store to go to in Chicago? I know like most of them are, have closed throughout the last 10 years, but right. yeah, I mean, now we're pretty much left with the Reckless Chain and uh, well, that's about it. Pretty much gramophone, stuff like that. But uh, how about 10 years ago, if you had all these choices, where would you go? Oh God! Ten years ago, probably Lori's. Lori's, okay. I used to live in Ravenswood, so I'd, I'd go there. Cool. Do you like the Reckless uh, chain? That I, I do. I always, you know, I got burned by several of their recommendations. You know how they have, you know, the stickers on the CDs. You know, recommended if you like this and blah blah blah. Sure. They were never accurate. Uh, I bought a lot of bad CDs because of them, but that's my own fault. Um, yeah, I mean, Reckless is cool. I, I've certainly spent a lot of money, at, you know, at their various locations. And the most recent, I think I bought some vinyl from them uh, at the downtown location in the Loop. Yeah, I mean, they're fine. I just, you know, honestly, I don't, I, I, I'm an aging man. I don't really go to record stores that often. I, I do do most of my uh, music shopping online. Sure, like most of us now, obviously. Um, it was kind of cool, though. I didn't know that Chris Conley of, you know, Ministry and Revolting Cox fame is now one of the, like, the general manager at Reckless. Oh, God, I think he's been in the, the record, I think he's been working record retail for ages. I mean, dating back to Wax Tracks, I think he worked the counter at Wax Tracks. He did, yes. And his book is amazing. If you want to re- read a good book about the whole industrial plus the north side of Chicago, good times in the late 80s, early 90s, that book is awesome. And I interviewed him. He brought me in the, you know, the back to the offices of Reckless. Completely awesome guy, real nice guy. So For sure. Yeah, I, 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 it's been ages since I talked to him, but he's, he's a good one, and I, I love his voice. Yeah, here, here's a weird one while I have you here. I, I did an awesome interview with Steve Albini about a year ago. He uh, he opened up his studio to us and just said, hey, let's do the interview in my studio. And, I mean, his reputation, like, it preceded him as being, you know, completely like a, a dark figure in rock, almost like a Darth Vader of indie rock. But couldn't be nicer, couldn't be more friendly and funny, too. Have you ever been able to talk to him? I, I've interviewed him once, and it, it's true. He has... A, a, great sense of humor he's a very intelligent guy i mean even if what he's saying is horseshit you, you believe it because he says what he's saying with such conviction and it is also well articulated i mean he's he's a really interesting guy he's i mean that is a big personality there yeah very big personality the way he sets up mics you can uh, you can sense him recording drums by just putting on an album you can you know hear it from 500 feet away that those drums were mic'd by Steve at electrical and it's just it's just some really original sound he's got there just got about one more I got two more things here did you hear the big news about the singer from against me uh, against he Oh, he did. He heard it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I was I was never a huge fan. I know Butch Vig recorded an album by them, but I, I heard a lot of buzz about four or five years ago from all my friends. Oh, you got to check out this band. Maybe I'll, it's about time I checked them out because, yeah, that's I don't know if that's going to bring them a huge bit of attention or if it's going to end up killing the band. or. Well, and, and I, honestly, they don't care. I mean, this is, you know, a really big, you know, it's a very personal thing that he's put out there and whatever good for him good for the band i whether obviously they don't care if it makes or breaks makes or breaks the band because this that's not what this is about 
Um, I, I think Against Me has a bunch of great songs. I, I still listen to Don't Lose Touch. I think that's an, an incredible single that never was. Um, yeah, good for him. I, that's that's his thing. That's that's the way he was wired. Awesome. Exactly. I don't have a horse in the race, but it, it'll be at least interesting to see just how their career, you know, takes place for the in the next couple of years. Sure. Uh, yeah, you, you were talking to De Regattas about how you're kind of out of the loop nowadays. He even told sure. me on the email. Um, just got one album to recommend here. Um, sure, you've heard of the band Spiritualized. Uh, speaking of De Regattas, that's one of his pet bands. Really? It, it is? Oh, okay. my God. Yeah, he loves anything that has that you can tie back to psychedelic rock. He, he's its most ardent supporter. Yeah, the new album, Sweetheart, Sweet Light, completely highly recommended. Um, Jason Pierce is a tortured, tormented soul, but I, he, I love he's got a classicist way of producing a record. You know, kind of sounds like early Stones meets Velvet Underground choruses. He's got Dr. John featured and co-writes a track, which I, nice. do, I do love Dr. John's new album, too, I think. Well, the new album's great. I, I've been a fan of Dr. John. I, I have haunting memories um back back before i got kicked out of college um i went to like i said i went to college in kansas and dr john was playing at a place in kansas city and this was maybe 88 89 and i went with a friend of mine and i was just so shit-faced out of my gourd i i don't do that anymore but uh back then i was and i just remember i don't remember anything that, that dr john played that night but i just remember yelling in between every song is there a doctor in the house <laughs> like just some drunk Dumbass. Oh, <laughs> I wish I was. Um, that, that's my that's my sad Dr. John memory. But yeah, I mean, wow, what a piano player! That that new album is just dark, swampy, and psychedelic. Um, and I went off on a tangent. You were recommending Spiritualized. Oh yeah, no, uh, yeah, but uh, they're both pretty awesome albums. I, I got the both of them in high rotation. I think that Dan Auerbach kid, Auerbach. Um, He's got to be like young enough to be Dr. John's grandson, but sure. he definitely brought his own style. I mean, it sounds like Black Keys a little bit and just like that sweaty drum beat that they brought. The drummer just kills it on that session. So those two albums are highly recommended by me. I know they're not any any kind of new band, really, but I, I thought I'd just throw those out at you. So. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm out of the loop. So thanks for plugging me in. So, yeah, so James Van Osdell, we got the James Van Osdell Show. What are, They post every Wednesday? Here. Yeah, I mean, when when Steve and I agreed to this whole thing that I'd be part of the network, we said it would be a monthly show, and I I just I kept doing them. So I, I think now there's an expectation that it's weekly, even though technically it's a monthly thing. So I just keep doing them weekly. Yeah, please bring them on weekly. I, I've I've been digging them. Just keep them coming. Um, if my listeners want to follow you on Twitter, what's the Twitter handle? It's a very complicated one. It's James Van Ostel. Well, how'd you come up with that? No, okay, awesome. <laughs> Just spitballing some night, coming up with ideas, and I landed on that. <laughs> yeah, and jamesvanosdell.com, correct? Yes. You'll find next to nothing there, but it sure would be nice if you stopped by. Sure, sounds good. And uh, the book, we're looking at a year-end uh, release or early next I think year? so. Yeah, like I said, I'm close to getting this in the hands of an editor. That When you do things yourself, yes, it's liberating, DIY, woo, this is great. Uh, but, man, there's a lot there's a lot involved, you know, there's legal, there's design, there's formatting, there's, you know, getting the, someone to write the forward. There's all sorts of stuff, making sure all the Kickstarter information, you know, all my backers names are correct. I'm still waiting on a couple essays from backers. So it's a lot of moving parts. Um, so assuming I can keep the, the pace I've been at, yeah, we'll say end of the year, February 1st at the absolute latest, and that's only if things go catastrophically wrong. Very awesome. Yeah, if you need a quote for the back of the book, let me know. Um, <laughs> I, I, I tweeted earlier today that I'm currently working on my autobiography. It's going to be sold exclusively at border stores. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Yeah, we're going to end it there, James. Um, thank you so much for taking out the time in your day. I know you're a busy guy. I um, sure. always looked up to your thoughts on music, and I continue to. And just find them at doll.com. Subscribe. You get the first month for free. So on behalf of James Van Osdell, this is Andy Dare signing off for The Andy Dare Show. Be sure to follow Andy on Twitter. That's at Andy Dare, A-N-D-Y-D-E-R-E-R. -E -E and like the show on Facebook. That's Facebook.com slash The Andy Dare Show. There's videos at YouTube.com slash Andrew Martin Dare. And it all leads back to the TheAndyDareShow.com. Support our show by supporting our sponsors, Uncle Bub's award-winning barbecue, The Man Great, and Secondhand Mall, all in picturesque Westmont, Illinois. Thank you so much for listening.